Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to talk more about garments because the video that I put out on Saturday night uh, really took off. Um, essentially, even though talking about the temple garment was only the first part of the video, you know, it was a small part of the video, it really brought everybody out of the woodworks to uh, comment on it. And uh, thankfully, the vast majority of people were in support of keeping covenants and wearing the temple garment appropriately and at all times. Um, but there were there was opposition and um, maybe more so than I, I see on other videos that I've done in the past. And the whole thing just kind of like I was kind of taken aback by because like on Saturdays and Sundays, as far as my channel goes, those are the days when there's le less views, less watch hours. People are spending their time doing stuff on Saturday or on Sunday, keeping the Sabbath holy and spending time with uh, family and friends and stuff like that. But uh, this video just took off like none other. And I felt like, wow. There is probably something here. What? Why was there such a strong response to it? Why was everything so emotionally charged as far as like people's response to it? And I have some ideas about that. Uh, so what I want to do here, and, and I hope that, you know, if you're someone that's struggling with wearing the temple garment when you should, you know, looking for times to take it off you feel that you've received special revelation that you don't have to. Um, you think it's okay to take it off, you know, just for all these like different situations. Um, I hope that this video will help you understand the importance of why you need to wear it as much as possible. It's not just underwear. It's not just like a tradition of our church. There is literal power that comes with wearing it. And uh, protection. Protection against what? Against Satan. And that's no joke. The first part of this video, we're going to talk about protection against Satan in the temple and in wearing the temple garment. Uh, I'm going to show you... First, we're going to focus on opposition. And then we're going to talk about... Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about some quotes that I found that have to do with the garment. And then uh, I also, there were a lot of like really good comments from the last video and I wrote a bunch of them down here. I, I had to put it on a spreadsheet because I tried to like highlight it uh, with my highlighter add on to Google Chrome, but it, it wasn't really working. So I had to uh, copy and paste it onto a spreadsheet uh, so I could keep track of all the, the comments that I wanted to share. So, okay. <clears throat> So why is it so important to wear the temple garment? Well, I think an answer for that can be found here. This is in the Millennial Star. This, is, this was um, written or said by George Q. Cannon. He was first counselor in the first presidency, the years 1877. And uh, this is what he says. And keep in mind that when we're talking about the temple here in this quote, this would also apply to you wearing the temple garment. Okay? So keep that in mind. Not, not just thinking about the temple, but thinking about the effects of the temple. People go in there, make covenants. They're clothed on with uh, righteousness and come out with that righteousness. And we're supposed to be wearing it all the time. Okay, so he says, Every foundation stone that is laid for a temple, and every temple completed according to the order uh, the Lord has revealed for his holy priesthood, lessens the power of Satan on the earth and increases the power of God and godliness, moves the heavens in mighty power in our behalf, invokes and calls down upon us the blessings of the eternal gods and those who reside in their presence. There is no doubt whatever of this in my mind. And those who have engaged in this work today must certainly have felt the spirit and power of it. There has been a holy influence here. Angels have been here. The presence of our Father, too, with all of his, his faithful servants who have stood firm, steadfast, and true 
while they were here upon the earth, and every person present who has been prepared to receive it has been filled with it. We are engaged in that great work, which will in time result in the complete overthrow of the power of Satan upon the earth, and of all those evil influences, of all that uh, misrule and oppression, and all of the wickedness that now causes earth itself to groan, and all its inhabitants to mourn. We are engaged in the work that will sweep evil from off the face of the earth, and establish the reign of peace and of truth and of righteousness, where the honest and the meek and the lowly shall have their rights, uh, and none dare molest or make them afraid. So, if you are the adversary listening to this, uh, this statement right here probably doesn't make you too happy. Your power being taken away, being swept off the face of the earth. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it, it talks about how the influence of Satan is reduced uh, with the temple. So it's logical to assume that he really isn't happy when temples are built uh, because of what they do to his power. And on an individual level, uh, it makes him upset that he has less influence over you, especially when you're wearing the temple garment and you're living righteously. But there, there's more. Okay, so now we're going to go to the Journal of Discourses. I have a new, I have a new topic here on my quotes A through Z. It's currently on row 71, opposition, and these are um, quotes that have to do with the opposition of the adversary to temples. Okay, so let's continue with this theme, this theme for just a little bit. Okay, now we're uh, listening to President Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, Volume 8, pages 355 to 356. And one thing in particular, let me say to you, <clears throat> in all your transactions in these public matters, do not do unless you want to. As we say to the saints, do not pay tithing unless you want to. Do not help build up this temple unless you want to. Do not put forth your hands uh, to one, one day's work unless you want to. Do not put forth your hands to build to help build the 70s hall unless you want to. If you grudgingly put forth your means to help gather the saints, it will be a curse to you. Okay, so the key word there, grudgingly, and it will actually be a curse to you. Uh, it will mildew, and every, every effort you make uh, will wither in your possession. If you do not wish to help, let it alone. But if you really want to help gather the saints, turn out with your teams as you agree to. If you wish this temple, to, this temple built, go to work and do all you can this season. Some say, I do not like to do it, for uh, we never began to build the temple without the bells of hell beginning to ring. Now that is interesting. It's interesting because this is referencing opposition to temple building. And you could also say uh, opposition to you wearing the temple garment after you've gone in and made the most serious of covenants. Okay, Brigham Young continues, I want to hear them again. All the tribes of hell will be on the move if we uncover the walls of this temple. But what do you think it will amount to? You have all the time seen what it has amounted to. I can say for my comfort and consolation, and for yours too, that we did build two temples and commenced another. We completed a temple in Kirtland and in Nauvoo, and did not the bells of hell toll all the time we were all the time we were building them? I'm going to highlight all the time. And can you imagine, you know, Satan probably desperately, desperately, desperately wants you to take down your defenses and stop wearing the garment. You know, at, you know, at, at, in any moment, for any reason, just take them off, take them off. Right? Because once they're down, that's when a lot of damage can be done. Can't do much while you're wearing the garment, but uh, 
taking it off, who knows what else he can do during that time that you may or may not perceive. Continuing, they did every week and every day, talking about the bells of hell ringing. Uh, for our consolation, I will say, we are here and not there. You cannot ride from here to Carthage in Hancock County, Illinois, before breakfast if you try. And everyone that now tries to come from Warsaw or Carthage to the headquarters of quote-unquote Mormonism will have to put more crackers in their pockets than they used to. What did they accomplish? They magnified the work of the Lord in the eyes of the nations. They are more afraid of our union than any other power. And, uh... Yeah, I guess he's kind of talking about those on Earth that are in opposition to the work, but I think probably more so he's referring to Satan and his followers that know perfectly well what's going on. They are more afraid of our union than any other power. They are afraid of the God that is within us. Right? And I don't know what he means here. He could mean a few different things. Um Namely, you know, having the spirit with you, for example, having the influence of God within you. But possibly another way that he's talking here is we know that we are gods in embryo. We have a great destiny, but you have to be worthy of it. You have to repent. You have to live uh, the commandments. Keep your covenants. Part of which is to wear the temple garment. You, you are a god inside in embryo you're not to the point that our heavenly father is at but you can be and uh satan is afraid of that because he will never be continuing if that union in the power of god is with 10 men they fear they fear that in them more than they fear a hundred thousand men that are not united here we are and i am satisfied okay go on to this and this isn't just something that was said you know back in the 1800s here's um gordon b hinckley at the time count uh, second counselor in the first presidency october 1985 general conference rejoice in this great era of temple building and this is what he says temple building and the dedication of temples have gone on at such a pace in the last few years that some pay little attention and feel it is of small significance but, and look, <clears throat> that same attitude can be present when we're thinking about garments. You know, like, ah, it's no big deal to go to the temple, wear garments. You know, this is part of my culture. I was born in the church, and it's just something that you do. It's no big deal. It's just a tradition. Okay, well, <clears throat> listen to this. But the adversary has not been unmindful of it. The building and dedication of these sacred... In fact, I should highlight that. But the adversary has not been unmindful of it. And I'm sure he's not unmindful of you taking off your garments. <clears throat> the building and dedication of these sacred edifices have been accompanied by a surge of opposition from a few enemies of the church, as well as criticism from a few within. And that is a problem. Okay. This has brought a mind, sorry, this has brought a mind, sorry, this has brought to mind a statement of Brigham Young in 1861 while the Salt Lake Temple was under construction. Evidently, when someone with previous experience was asked to work on the Salt Lake Temple, he responded, I do not like it, for we never began to build the temple without the bells of hell ringing. <coughs> um... And then he, he, he quotes a part of what we just read. And then he continues. Yes, in these recent times, we have felt much opposition. But we have also noted the frustration of those who have tried to stop this work. Interesting. We have noted the frustration. Okay. We have been strengthened and we have been strengthened. See? And that's why they're frustrated. And we have... <clears throat> moved forward under the promise of the Lord, who said, I will not suffer that they, the enemy, shall destroy my work. Yea, I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. 
then I think I had, yeah, just one more here. Okay, <clears throat> this is from uh, Elder Bednar, and this is the most recent quote that I know of. If you have more, feel free to send them my way, please. Um, April 2009 General Conference, honor honorably holding, or sorry, honorably hold a name in standing. We live in a great day of temple building around the world, and the adversary surely is mindful of the increasing number of temples that now dot the earth. That's interesting because he's essentially repeating the same word that uh, Gordon B. Hinckley used, or the same words, the adversary is mindful. Again, I'm sure that he's mindful of the ever-increasing number of people wearing the temple garment when they come out of the temple and take a part of the temple with them and that he has less influence over. As always, the building and dedicating of these sacred structures are accompanied by opposition from en enemies of the church as well as by ill-advised criticism from some within the church. You know, he, he is essentially just uh, repeating what President Hinckley said. I didn't really realize that till just now with like this part right here. Uh, criticism, criticism from some within the church. It just, it blows my mind. Opposition from enemies and from people that are uh, in the church. But there are we, and there are tares. There are fakers. And there's probably people that are under the influence of the adversary, frankly. Even if, if they're not someone that's fake, you know, they're not going to church for cultural reasons or for narcissistic reasons because uh, they found a place where they can gain attention um, or some kind of benefit. Um, there's probably people that yield themselves so much and lower their, their standards so much that Satan really does have a lot more power over them than maybe what they realize or maybe they do. I don't know. It, it's just, it's so sad. Such, anta such antagonism is not you, not new. In 1861, while the Salt Lake Temple was under construction, Brigham Young encouraged the saints. Okay, and then he quotes what we already read. We as faithful saints have been strengthened by adversity and are the recipients of the Lord's tender mercies. We have moved forward under the promise of the Lord. I will not suffer that mine enemies shall destroy my work. Yea, I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. That's what President Hinckley said as well in his talk. He must he must have like read President Hinckley's talk and he's like, you know what, this needs to be brought up again. Because that talk was in 1985 and this one is in 2009. So it's a very appropriate reminder. For many years, Sister Bednar and I uh, hosted faithful men and women as devotional speakers at BYU-Idaho. Many of these speakers were emeritus or released members of the 70 who had served as temple presidents following their service as general authorities. Uh, if you didn't know, um, once a 70 reaches his 70th birthday, it's around that time that he's released. Uh, I still haven't found a reason why other than to highlight the number 70. If you have any information about that, preferably something written down, some uh, source, please send it my way. As we talked with the stalwart leaders, I always ask this question. What have you learned as a temple president uh, that you wish you had better understood when you were a general authority? As I listened to their answers, I discovered a consistent theme that I would summarize as follows. I have come to understand better the protection available through our temple covenants. This is a really key concept, you guys. It's a way to protect yourself. Continuing, in what it means to make an acceptable offering of temple worship. There's a difference between church attending, tithe paying members who occasionally rush into the temple. I'm going to highlight that. To go through a session and those members who faithfully and consistently worship in the temple. And frankly, that's something that I need to do better at. 
The similarity of their answers impressed me greatly. Each responded to my question focused upon the protecting power of the ordinances and covenants av available in the house of the Lord. Protecting power. Their answer is precisely paralleled the promises contained in the dedicatory prayer offered upon the Kirtland Temple in 1836. We ask thee, Holy Father, to establish the to establish the people that shall worship and honorably hold a name in standing in this thy house to all generations and for eternity. That no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that he who diggeth a pit for them shall fall into this the same himself, that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over thy people upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. And if any people shall rise against this people, that thine anger be kindled against them. And if they shall smite this people, thou shalt smite them. Thou wilt fight for thy people as thou didst in the day, the day of battle, that uh, they may be delivered from the hands of all their enemies. Now remember, <clears throat> the Kirtland Temple, we do not yet have the uh, ordinances that we do now we, we th there weren't any initiatories endowments or anything like that going on in the Kirtland temple there is still protection simply by going to the temple just simply by going there but even more so going through getting your endowments and then wearing the garment okay elder bendar <clears throat> please consider these verses in light of the current raging of the adversary going to highlight that raging of the adversary and what we have discussed about our willingness to take upon us the name of jesus christ and the blessings of protection there it is promise to those who honorably hold a name in standing in the holy temple I'll highlight that not just in the church but even more so in the temple Significantly, these covenant these covenant blessings are to all generations and for all and for all eternity. I invite you to study repeatedly and ponder prayerfully the implications of these scriptures in your life and for your family. We should not be surprised by Satan's efforts to thwart or discredit temple worship and work, and that would also include wearing the temple garment. The devil despises the purity in the power of the Lord's house and the protection available to each of us in and through temple ordinances and covenants stands as a great obstacle to the evil designs of Lucifer. I'm going to just highlight this entire, that entire paragraph. That's really the crux of it. He doesn't want you to be protected. He wants you to be uh, influenceable, right? He wants you to be under his influence. Um, he's raging. He's doing whatever he can to get you in a state where you're not protected from him. And uh, the thing that stops that is the temple living within our covenants and wearing the temple garment. Okay, so that's it for that. Now, let's move on to... Garments under row 35. I, I have it under garment temple, car, garment comma temple. So a temple garment. And there's a lot of really good things here. Um, actually, <clears throat> yeah, I think I'll read this first and then we'll move on. Like I said, we'll move on to the comments that people shared in the last video. Okay, now this is from a first presidency letter uh, dated October 10th, 1988. And uh, you can find this portion of it. I don't know if it's the entire letter, but uh, you can find this. <clears throat> excuse me. You can find this in the end sign. And I have the link there. All right. So it says, this is from the first presidency. Practices frequently observed among the members of the church suggest that some members do not fully understand the covenant they make in the temple. <clears throat> to wear the garment in accordance with the spirit of the holy endowment. 
Well, and I question that, you know, it could be that there's uh, members that don't fully understand it. That That is certainly, I'm not going to go against what the First Presidency is saying, but I, I feel like there are some that do understand it and knowingly go against it. People that are toxic, people that have other motives, other priorities, um, where God is not the top priority, and neither is the temple. People that go to church for cultural reasons, or like I said, predators that make their way into the church because they get some kind of benefit from the church, whether it's monetary, whether it's um, just simply getting attention, admiration, you know, people that put on the church costume uh, and play that lifestyle because they ra- in their mind they rack up a lot of points doing that because they're trying to harvest attention. So I think there's some that it's not so much that they don't understand with this other group, but that they don't care. Hopefully you're in the category if you're one that doesn't that you don't wear your garments like you should. Hopefully you're in the in the this category that you don't fully understand and hopefully this video helps you. That's the goal. Okay, continuing it says church members who have been clothed in the garment in the temple have made a covenant to wear it throughout their lives. This has been interpreted to mean that it is worn as underclothing both day and night. The promise of protection and blessings is cautioned upon is cautioned upon worthiness and faithfulness in keeping the covenant. Protection and blessings. The protection keeps coming up over and over and over and over again. Continuing, the fundamental principle ought to be to wear the garment and not to find occasions to remove it. Thus, members should not remove either all or part of the garment to, to, to work in the yard or to lounge around the home in swimwear or in modest clothing. Or you could say today, uh, like these like um, legging shorts or things like that. No, okay. Nor should they remove it to participate in recreational activities that can reasonably be done with the garment worn properly beneath regular clothing. When the garment must be removed, such as for swimming, it should be restored as soon as possible. And you have to wonder, do we do that? And there's been times that I've gone to the gym and then it's like, okay, you know, while we're out, let's uh, hurry and run to this place and we'll go shopping and stuff. And uh, that's something that I used to do. But recently I've, I've had a change of heart thinking about this specifically, how the garment should be restored as soon as possible. And so I've gone through the effort to, okay, let's go home, shower, change. I, I don't want to shower at the gym. Um, we have like a small gym and, and there's like these two bathrooms and it's uh, just like one person at a time. So it's nice. There's privacy and they do have a nice shower. And I, I just, whatever I do, who cares? That's not what this is about. The principles of modesty and keeping the body appropriately covered are implicit in the covenant and should govern the nature of all clothing worn. Endowed members of the church wear, wear the garment as a reminder of the sacred covenants that they made with the Lord and also as a protection against temptation and evil a protection against satan how is it worn how it is worn is an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow the savior next now this one okay <laughs> i think some people are going to get upset at this potentially there is an article in the august 1997 Ensign by Carlos E. Uh, Ass or Assay, I think I don't know Assay. I don't know. Uh, he was he was um, temple president of the Salt Lake Temple, and oh my gosh, there's so much good stuff in here. So hold on. He says a few years ago in a seminar for new temple presidents and matrons, Elder James E. Faust, then the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, told about his being called as a as, to serve as a general authority. He was asked only one question by President Harold B. Lee. 
do you wear the garments properly? To which he answered in the affirmative. He then asked President Lee, uh, he, he then asked if President Lee wasn't going to ask him about his worthiness. President Lee replied that he didn't need to, for he had learned from experience that how one wears the garment is the expression of how the, how the individual feels about the church and everything that relates to it. It is a measure of one's worthiness in devotion to the gospel. Yikes. Yikes. Now, you know, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad, and I didn't say this in the first place. Sometimes people put comments as though I'm the one that's saying these things. He's in a position to do so. So, if you're if you're not understanding the temple garment, what we've learned so far is that it provides you with protection. Uh, you made a covenant, or in other words, the most serious of promises, uh, the most serious of contracts to do so. But this is another thing. President Lee replied that he didn't need to, for he had learned from experience that how one wears the garment is the expression of how the individual feels about the church and everything that relates to it. It is a measure of one's worthiness in devotion to the gospel. There are some who would welcome a detailed dress code answering every conceivable question about the wearing of the temple garment. They would have priesthood leaders legislate lengths, specify conditions, of when and how it should and should not be worn and impose penalties upon those who miss the mark by a fraction of an inch. Such individuals would have church members strain at a thread and omit, omit the weightier matters of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, we can go extreme the other way and that's not what we want to do. And again, it's my belief that the people that are prone to that behavior going completely the other direction to an extreme are those people that are wearing the church outfit, the church costume where they found a knack at, Oh, this is how I'm going to get attention. Just like in the new Testament, that was a big problem at the time uh, when Christ came, the church was not as it should be. The people that were leaders in the church, they were leaders because they were looking for power, admiration, attention, devotion, whatever. And so that was the type of behavior that they engaged in. This is the type of behavior that you see in HOAs where you have a person that has the tiniest little bit of power and goes around and nitpicks at all these like little things. And what's sad to me is that this entire, this entire uh, article in the Ensign uh, there's there's an there's another website out there that covers things like this, and this is one of the only things that they quoted. This part of the entire article that goes on to stress how important the garment is, because some people would look at this and feel like vindication, like ah, oh, see, I don't have to really worry about it. The only people that you know wear it all the time are those like Pharisee type people uh, that are always. Uh, straining at a thread and okay, whatever that, you know, the, uh, th there's, there's groups out there that stress this more than the things that are really, really important. Like, yes, this is bad behavior. This is bad behavior to like go around acting as an inquisitor in your ward or social media or whatever. We shouldn't be inquisitors. But at the same time, it's appropriate to talk about it, to be an example, to share these things so that we don't forget about it. We don't forget the importance and talk about the importance of it. Just, just be centered. Don't go to one extreme or the other. Don't be the type that's like, well, no, I get, it's hot. I don't have to wear it. Or I prayed and it was OK. I was it was like, Heavenly Father understands. That's one extreme. The other extreme is, hey, why aren't you wearing it? Why are you wearing shorts? You shouldn't wear shorts with the army. Those are two extremes. 
And we're not asked to pick one or the other. Just be in the center. And be exact. So, again, these other, these, these different groups, websites, blogs, whatever, that are always stressing the one extreme of, see, you know, that's not right to be exact. And it's okay to just, like, let your hair down and don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah, don't be so hard on yourself, but just do what's appropriate. You don't have to pick one or the other. Just be in the middle. Be on the straight and narrow path. Most Latter-day Saints, however, rejoice over the moral agency extended them by a loving Father in Heaven. They prize highly the trust placed in them by the Lord and church leaders, a trust implied in this statement made by the Prophet Joseph Smith. I teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. Which some people would take to mean, see, I can, like, I, it, it's all up to me. It's up to me. No, it's not up to you. It's based on correct principles. Principles of which um, the prophet and apostles and general authorities and general officers of the church talk about during general conference and in the ensign and we learn from church manuals and that we talk about at church. This is not a free ticket to just do whatever you want or to be your own little um, exemption ticket writer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip down a little bit. I believe there is a critical body of knowledge relating to the temple garment. When the knowledge is obtained, Latter-day Saints filled with faith wear the garment and wear it properly. Not because someone is policing their actions, but because they understand the virtues of the sacred clothing and want to do good, to be restored unto that which is good. On the other hand, when one does not understand the sacred nature of the temple garment, the tendency is to treat it casually and regard it as just another piece of clothing or of cloth. So here he, he addresses the two extremes. Don't be on either extreme. Be in the middle. The critical body of knowledge associated with the garment of the Holy Priesthood may be categorized under three headings. Armor of God is one. Historical background, two. And teachings of modern prophets, three. I shall present some information pertaining to each of these headings, hoping that the thoughts shared will provoke a greater appreciation of the garment and stir a great resolve in the minds of saints to wear it willfully and properly. I'm going to highlight willfully. Armor of God. Okay, so number one, we are at war. And, and Satan doesn't want you to think that. He wants you to go along with the world and be like, yeah, this is, I mean, this it's life, you know, live your best life. Just be happy. Go to concerts, go to football games, go to whatever, go fishing. It's just life. There's nothing going on here. No, no, we are at war. A war that's been going on since before this world. Okay. Our enemy is not an invading army from a bordering nation or a navy navy of some overseas power bullets are not whizzing above our heads nor are bombs exploding in and around our homes nevertheless we are engaged in a life and death struggle with forces capable of thrashing us inside out and sending us inside out and sending us down into the depths of spiritual defeat if we are not vigilant in one way to be vigilant is to wear your wear the temple garment. You guys, when I was when I was de, when I was deployed to Afghanistan, okay, it was really stressed the importance of being a hard target instead of a soft target. And what that meant was, you know, when you're deployed, everyone's issued a weapon and you keep it on you twenty four seven. Uh, you, you literally sleep with it. Now, you do that in basic training because basic training kind of like, in a way, kind of like simulates the deployment lifestyle and, and procedures and stuff like that. But when, so in basic training, you sleep with the weapon, but you don't have 
uh, actual ammo with you. But when you're deployed, you do. <laughs> it was the most bizarre thing in my life. Sleeping in my bunk with a... It wasn't loaded. It's supposed to be in the, the yellow. Uh, I think it was yellow. They have like different condition codes. Like red is where there's a... Uh, where you have a, a round that's chambered. You know, but... Uh, you sleep with the with it in yellow condition where you don't have a round chambered, but you do have the magazine in and stuff. It was, it was a really weird experience. <laughs> but but uh, as you're walking around the base or the FOB, you know, the forward operating base, uh, you're supposed to be a hard ta- target. In my case, we were in, in Bagram and uh, there were a lot of Afghans that worked on the base and they came onto the base daily to work, do their thing. And uh, among them were uh, occasionally people that wanted to do us harm and did do us harm. In fact, um, it w- okay, so <clears throat> after my deployment, exactly like almost exactly one year later, my company uh, deployed again to the same location to perform the same mission. Uh, I didn't go that time because I was going I was leaving the army. Um, but on that deployment, there, there was a suicide bombing that took place. It was on veterans day of all days because, uh, they were going to, cause like they do a bunch of like morale type things when you're deployed. Uh, there, there's a bunch of different activities and one of which in this case was a run around the base, uh, like a veterans day run. And, uh, th- that's a time when you don't have your weapons and um, that was when they chose to attack. And they killed three uh, in my company. And uh, which was really, it was really heartbreaking because um, I was the one that actually issued them their gas masks before they went. Uh, there, was, there was a couple guys I didn't know too well because they had joined the company right before going. One was just freshly, freshly out of basic training. The other two were sergeants. Um, The one I knew a lot better because he had been with the company for a while. But the the enemy took advantage of a time when they were soft targets. And it 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 killed a few other civilians too. Like there were civilian contractors that were there too. Um, So we were supposed to at all times. I'm sure that they made changes after that happened. But... When I was there, you were, you were always supposed to have your your hands on your weapon, like not just have it hanging from you, you know, from the sling, but to actually have it on you as though you could quickly, um, you know, raise your your weapon and fire at an imminent threat, you know. And uh, I took that seriously, and some people didn't, but I did uh, all the time. It, it's like called uh, having your weapon at the low ready. Where, you know, it's not, it's like one stage behind, like high ready. Anyway, when you remove your garment, you become a a soft target. You understand? It's not just underwear. We have the convenience of wearing it as underwear. And that's wonderful. But it's not just underwear. It is, it's robes of, or it's, um the garment of the priest it's the garment of the te- the temple garment and it comes with actual protection okay continuing i refer of course to the wrestle against principalities powers rulers of darkness and i'm going to skip down talking about paul he says he knew that armor made of truth righteousness faith spirit and prayer would protect people from the fiery darts crafted and thrown by satan and his henchmen However, this is, however, another piece of armor worthy of our consideration. It is the special underclothing known as the temple garment, or garment of the holy priesthood, worn by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, who have received their temple endowment. This garment, worn day and night, serves three important purposes. It is a reminder of the sacred covenants made with the Lord in his holy house, a protective covering for the body, and a symbol of the modesty of dress and living that should 
characterize the lives of all the humble, humble followers of Christ. Modesty. Right? Putting a limit on yourself and um, in some cases checking your pride if you're trying to show off in order to get attention and admiration and so forth. It is written that the white garment symbolizes purity and helps assure modesty, respect for the attributes of God, and to the, deg to the degree it is honored, a token of what Paul regarded as taking upon the whole armor of God. That's interesting, to the degree that it's honored. So you could be wearing it, but to what degree are you honoring it? Garments bear several simple marks of orientation toward the gospel principles of obedience, truth, life, and discipleship in Christ. Those four uh, principles. Obedience. Obedience. Not selective obedience. And I have a whole separate row for that. Truth, life, and discipleship in Christ. Uh, much, much more can be said about the war for the souls of men and the whole armor of God. The war on earth began in the days of Adam. Um, it's talking about the war on earth, but obviously it continued before that into the pre-existence. Uh, continued down through the years with Moses and the children of Israel and still rages in a dispensation known as the fullness of times. A dispensation ushered by the revelations received by the prophet Joseph Smith. Hence, the issue of protective coverings enables us to withstand the fiery darts of Satan uh, will continue to be of great influence. We must put on the armor of God spoken of by the Apostle Paul and re reiterated in a modern revelation. We must also put on the armor of righteousness symbolized by the temple garment. Otherwise, we may lose the war and perish. And when he says that, he's not talking about the church as a whole. He's talking about you individually. The heavy armor worn by soldiers of a former day, including helmets, shields, and breastplates, determine the outcome of some battles. However, the real battles of life in our modern day will be won by those who are clad in spiritual armor. In armor consisting of faith in God, faith in self, faith in one's cause, and faith in one's leaders. The piece of armor called the temple garment not only provides the comfort and warmth of a, cloth, of a cloth covering, it also strengthens the wearer to resist temptation, fend off evil influences, and stand firmly for the right. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing let me just skim through it really quick and see if there were any other really key points. I'm going to skip down to teachings of modern prophets. I fear that too many church members take for granted the, uh, the promise of protection and blessings associated with the temple garment. Some wear it improperly and others remove it to suit whims of circumstance. In such cases, the instructions of modern prophets, seers, and revelators are ignored and spiritual protection placed in jeopardy. Um, let's skip down. The fundamental principle ought to be the fundamental principle ought to be to wear the garment and not to find occasion to remove it. Thus, members should not remove either all or part of the garment. Okay, I already no, sorry, he's we already read that. Sorry. Uh, President Joseph F. Smith had strong feelings about the proper wearing of the garment. Said he, quote, The Lord has given unto us garments of the holy priesthood. And you know how, and you know what that means. You guys, I don't want to reduce the temple to like a video game, but I feel like it's a fitting uh, metaphor. Undoubtedly, most of you have played video games or you're at least familiar with video games. And in the video game, uh, typically you're the protagonist, and um, there, there are games where you literally, in the game, you go into uh, a castle, and um, you come out with like some treasure, you know, you either through conquest, 
uh, which is not so much the case here. I guess my spiritual conquest, I guess you could look at it that way. Or you could look at it like, I'm trying to think back to Zelda Ocarina of Time on the Nintendo 64. Maybe my favorite game of all time. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if like he ever, well, okay. You can think of a game where you like go somewhere to like a castle and there's uh, somebody there that a friendly that gives you like this new item, you know, a new shield, a new suit of armor or something that that's actually what happens to us when we go to the temple. And I'm not trying to, again, I'm not trying to d reduce the temple down to a video. game. <laughs> I'm not trying to reduce the temple to a video game. But you can see you can see what that is. You you actually go into a temple and you come out with something. You come out with armor. It's not just like this like intangible like protection, you know, that you can't really you you come out with a physical tangible uh armor on that was given to you by God. So yeah, probably pretty important. Okay, so Joseph S. Smith, the Lord has given unto us garments of the holy priesthood. And you and you know what that means. And yet there are those of us who mutilate them in order to in order that we may follow the foolish, vain, and permit me to say, indecent practices of the world, in order that such persons may imitate the fashions they will not hesitate to mutilate that which should be held held by them the most sacred of all things in the world next to their own virtue next to their own purity of life they should hold these things that god has given them given unto them sacred unchanged and unaltered from the very pattern in which god gave them let us have the moral courage to stand against the opinions of fashion and especially where fashion compels us to break a covenant and so commit a grievous sin. Okay, we're going to skip down. Uh, okay, I like to think of the garment as the Lord's way of letting us take a part of the temple with us when we leave. It is true that we carry from the Lord's house inspired teachings and, and sacred covenants uh, written in our minds and hearts. However, the one tangible re remembrance we carry with us back into the world is the garment. And though we cannot always be in the temple, a part of it can always be with us to bless our lives. That, that goes along with the concept I was just talking about. Um, okay, so you can read the rest of this some other time, um, either here on my spreadsheet or or in that Enzyme article. Um, geez Louise, okay, is there anything else that I want to... Just President Nelson, he referenced it or talked about the importance in 2001. Lisa S. Reeves... Worthy of Our Promised Blessings, October 2015 General Conference, Second Counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency, says there are also great blessings and protecting promises associated with the, pow the proper wearing of our temple garment. I have come to feel that I am symbolically putting on royal robes given, given me by my Heavenly Father. I testify, sisters, that when we strive to wear the garment properly, our Father recognizes it as a great sign of our love and devotion to him. All right, and then... Um, yeah, I should read this too. The wearing of such a garment... So this is from Preparing to Enter the Holy Temple. Last Modified 2021. This is on the church website. The wearing of such a garment does not prevent members from dressing in a fashionable clothing generally, worn in the nations of the world. Only clothing that is immodest or extreme in style would be incompatible with wearing the garment. Any member of the church, whether he or she has been to the temple or not, 
would would in proper spirit want to avoid extreme in revealing fashions. And, and I have to say something to that. If you're drawn to uh, to extreme uh, or extreme fashions or immodest clothing, there is a reason for that. And the reason is, okay, the, comfort could be one, but I think the vast majority of the time, it's because you're trying to broadcast a message to the world because, or you're trying to, you're wearing it um, as a magnet. You're wanting people to look at you and admire you or think of you in a certain way. It all has to do with getting attention. <laughs> look inside yourself and think, is that why I want to do this? And I'm going to be frank. At the very beginning of this channel, I started out with a beard. And you know what? I liked how it looked because I wanted to project a certain image to the world. I wanted to look cool because beards are becoming more and more <clears throat> accepted and um, more prevalent. But that was, I guess you could say, the ultimate goal. Now, to be fair... I do think it looks pretty good on me, but I don't think this is the time to be doing that because the reason why is because it is more associated and it is more a symbol of counterculture than it is, you know, whatever. And you might be like, well, back in the day of uh, Brigham Young and Jesus, Jesus himself, they had beers. That's because back in those days, it wasn't a, a sign of rebellion. When you when you look at some kind of style, and it's edgy, meaning meaning that there's like a border, there's a line. You're at the edge of what's acceptable, what's socially acceptable. If you're being edgy, you're like going up to the line, or possibly crossing over the line, uh, in order to look cool and to be rebellious. There's no end to the examples in the world where rebelliousness, rebelliousness against gospel principles um, is considered cool. You see it all the time. You see it at the mall. You see it in movies. Everyone glorifies being edgy and being rebellious against true principles. So... Um, I'm not so sure that the problem there is anything that has to do with the garment so much as a, a deep-seated desire to look cool and to get attention. Okay, let's see. That's it for that. Now, to finish this off, I want to read through some of the comments that some of you left. And there were so many good comments, but I can't read them all. And by the way, um, if you don't get a heart from me on your comment or a response, do not take it personally ever because I have very limited time. It's already enough putting out two videos a day that are an hour's worth of content and all the preparation for that. And then on top of that, you know, family responsibilities and homestead responsibilities and going to the gym and running errands and on and on and on and on. It's just... When I get on my phone and I'm looking through comments, usually the comments that are shorter are the easier ones to respond to because if it's a longer comment, then I have to like be like, okay, is this person looking for a response from me? Because I'm not just going to do a heart if they're like asking me a question or if it merits a response. So I, I just I just have limited time and I don't go through all the comments because I don't have enough time. So just keep that in mind. Okay. It's not personal. Okay, so the first one, um, this is from, let's see, should we zoom in one more time? Yes. The first one is from uh, the handle, and I, I don't like that YouTube has done this. They, they have like your username, but now there's like these handles as well. And uh, now when I go through comments, it just shows the handle rather than your username. Whatever. Okay, so the first one is from uh, Cause of Zion. And this person says, 
Uh, some statements from the Utah area leadership broadcast last year. Elder Pearson, area president, president said, quote, We are dismayed by the casual and even cavalier way some treat their temple covenants. Let's look up cavalier. What does that mean? Actually, let's go to, I sh okay, let me pull up my dictionaries. That's what I should do. Dictionaries, there's three that I use for the purposes of this channel. One is Merriam-Webster, Oxford Learners, and then uh, Webster 1828. And let's start with Webster 1828. Cavalier. One, a horseman, especially an armed horseman, a knight. Two, uh, <laughs> okay, we all we all know how this word was used back then compared to right now. Number two, a gay sprite. <laughs> Okay. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> okay, a, a gay, sprightly military man. Number three, the appellation of the party of King Charles the First. Four, in fortification, in elevation of earth, situated ordinarily in the gorge of a bastion, um, bordered with a parapet or parapet. I don't know which uh, embrasures. Okay, whatever. So you're you're getting some like military. Uh, imagery here. Oh, and for adjective, that was for noun. For adjective, it's set for one, it's gay, sprightly, warlike, brave, generous, and then number two, haughty or disdainful. That is a really sad thing to think uh, if that's how people treat their temple covenants. We are dismayed by the casual and even cavalier meaning haughty, disdainful, warlike. Let's see, let's look at Oxford's. Not caring enough about something important or about feelings of other people. And then in Merriam-Webster, marked by, marked by or given to offhand and often disdainful dismissal of important matters. Jeez, we are dismayed by the casual and even cavalier way some treat their temple covenants, including the casual and inconsistent wearing of the temple garment. There is among some a growing sense of spiritual apathy and sporadic covenant keeping. In other words, um, selective obedience, and I'll do a video about that in the future. Uh in sporadic covenant keeping that is becoming increasingly common among those who should know and do better, end quote. We are, well, I guess it continues later on. Uh, we are confident that if these sacred covenants were better understood, they would be honored and cherished above all other commitments. Well, like I said before, I personally question that. There, there's probably some that just don't understand I think that there's many others that are simply tares and they don't care. They're cavalier. They're rebellious. They have other prior priorities like looking uh, sexy for people and getting attention and or, oh, this is just inconvenient. I shouldn't have to do this. It's just underwear anyway. OK, covenant keeping. Uh, no, 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 no. Honoring covenants is not optional. Covenant keeping, covenant keeping has nothing to do with personal preference or convenience and everything to do with commitment. The faithful are those who place the Savior and their sacred covenants at the center of their lives. You could also say that as top priority. Elder Christofferson spoke first and said he had reviewed uh, their presentations and endorsed what they would be saying and teaching. So they are aware of what is happening and have spoken about it. I thought Elder Pearson's words were pretty strong and direct. I guess our opportunity is to be examples and help others understand and cherish covenants. And, you know, I would say we need to talk about it more and not uh, be like hush hush about it. Like, again, 
don't get to the point where you're an inquisitor. But it's totally appropriate to talk about it here on YouTube. It's appropriate for you to talk about it uh, in conversations. And um, don't be don't be afraid of upsetting somebody if you're speaking truth. As long as you're not being antagonistic, you're not like picking a fight or looking for a fight, um, and you're not being an inquisitor. But otherwise, it's okay to talk about true t true principles. And for that to be repeated so that more people hear it, so they understand what the expectations are. Okay, the next one is from NoHandle88. <laughs> it says, um, they are going without garments because we also have leaders who are convinced that loving the youth means not having expectations of them. Yep. And, w and where, do we, where do we learn uh, lessons like that, you know, in pop culture? Uh, one that comes to mind is Little Nemo, or no, Finding Nemo, <laughs> Little Nemo, Finding Nemo. This was a movie that really, really was popular. Uh, even to this day, you still see people um, kind of like flat out just copying uh, this this pair right here, these two different type of fish, clownfish and whatever she is. You see it in like video games. You see it at aquariums. Aquariums always make sure that they have these two types of fish uh, so that kids will be like, oh, look, it's like Nemo. But uh, the moral of this story, it seems to me, wasn't so much that Nemo should have listened to his dad. Um, it's that no, uh, Marlin was being overbearing and uh, shouldn't have tried to keep his son safe. He was being too overprotective and that actually drove Nemo to be rebellious. So it's really, it's the parents' fault. I I cannot stand this. And this is, this happens a lot in different uh, kid shows. It's always like the parents that are the bad guys or the parents need to lighten up, right? It's just, it's awful. So is it any wonder that these people that live materially, you know, they're they're mostly concerned about their comfort and living a soft life and living in soft communities, which are, by the way, are depicted is depicted in this movie. At the very beginning, you have uh, Marlin and his wife. Uh, she had just laid eggs. <laughs> so they were expecting and uh, Marlin had found like a great home and the way that they depicted in the movie is like one of these nice brand new uh communities of like young families uh you know these organized community you you get the distinct sense that they had just moved into uh essentially metaphorically a brand new development with brand new homes other young families you know Costco going, movie going, pleasure going, you know, games, entertainment, big homes, so on and so forth, you know. So is it any surprise that that message rubs off on people? No, no handle 88 continues. I attended a youth dance recently and was shocked to see more than half the young women in short shorts and crop tops. Uh, some even had those shorts that show your beep cheeks. I also, just kidding. I also learned that, uh, I also learned that to, I also learned that to youth pool activities, they were wearing bikinis and thongs. And the young men are present at these events. I spoke about it to my stake president because uh, seeing, seeing the youth dressed, Seeing the youth dressed like this was very triggering to me because of something I went through last year. His response in the stake young women's presidents was to release me as a counselor in the stake young women's. Uh, the young the young women president didn't understand what my issue with the clothes was. What? Now, of course, no handle eighty eight. We're we're taking your word for it. There. I don't know the whole situation. I'm not calling you a liar, but I'm just going to give you the benefit of a doubt. Uh, she even said, I have no problem with the two pieces. I don't have the body for it, so I wouldn't wear it, but they do. <sighs> oh, for 
heaven's sake. Are you being serious right now? The counselor, the counselor that remains agreed with me, but they told her they know there is room for improvement. The stake president has been there for over three years, and I've been serving in the ward young women for longer than that, and at no point has there uh, even been a meeting to talk with the youth about modesty. So they tell the youth over and over that they are the very elect, a chosen generation, but at the same time, they treat them like glass. Afraid the smallest expectation will cause them to go less active. I'm telling you, once my kids are, are youth age, if this is still the state of things, they will not be going to the church dances. So they're going without garments because if they are spending their youth thinking dressing like this is okay, then garments are going to, are going to be a big shock and too much of a change to get used to. We are setting them up for failure. So sad. I can't agree more. I can't agree more. And that's something that we do in our family. We we check the modesty. I know it can sometimes be hard because of the type of clothes that are sold in stores. You know, it's it's so disgusting that for for children, you know, they market things that are immodest, you know, in a kid like way. But it sets you up for the future just to continue living like that. My gosh. Like th th this ridiculousness about not being able to speak truth because you're afraid that people are going to call you judgmental, <clears throat> for example, because <clears throat> that, that could be another thing. One concern may be like, oh, gosh, we got to be careful because we don't want to put too much pressure on them. Which, you know, it should be handled with care. There's a way to do things, but we should not remain silent because um, it's too hurtful or, or because we're afraid people are going to, um, call us judgmental. Whenever you speak the truth, it will, uh, inevitably, uh, cause contention. If the person that you're, you're talking to, uh, is against that. And it's not because you're looking for a fight. It, it depends on how the other person responds and we got to make sure that we're in check, but we still have to speak truth. You can't just be quiet and just like let things keep going the way that they are. You need to talk about things openly. Uh, and, and that's what and that's what Satan wants. He wants us to be quiet. You know, as soon as you start talking, it's like no, 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 shh, shh, quiet, 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 quiet. And that I feel like sometimes that's uh, the treatment that I get and other people that speak truth. It's like people just be like, you need to be quiet. You need to not say things like this. You need to, no, 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 no. I'm trying to do my best, not looking for a fight, but I am going to speak the truth. And you should too. The next one is Fox MCB. I recently shocked, I, okay, I recently was shocked by most of my family, my children, and their spouses forsaking the garments. Like Andrea commented, I felt a great loss. My son went on to say he couldn't understand why I cared so much about his quote-unquote underwear. He went on to tell me of how he is doing Mormonism, quote-unquote. I asked him if he believed Jesus Christ died for our sins. He kind of hemmed and hawed like his answer was not really. In confiding with my son-in-law about how I was feeling about my children forsaking their covenants, he implied that there would be a time in the millennium for my for my son to repent. You guys, enough with the the procrastination. That's the whole problem with this idea of going from kingdom to kingdom after the test of life uh, is over. The, the scriptures repeatedly say this is the place where we do our work. And it does include the spirit world, right? And as long as that you're in mortality. But um, we don't have all the time in the world to do this. And I read script. Okay, I'm not going to get into the kingdoms of glory, whatever. We'll move on. She, uh, this person continues, of course, there will be still a missionary work going on for those who have not heard the gospel, but it is different 
it is a different situation when covenant people break their covenants and are in a state of no repentance when Christ returns. Thank you for all you do. Kathy Baldwin, Elizabeth, Colorado. P.S. I have four Temple married children and only one child and her husband are on the covenant path. My heart is broken. Uh, these are indeed the last days. I was not ready to lose most of my family. Well, I would agree there, there's still time. As long as all of us are alive, there's still time. And even in the spirit world, there's still time. Uh, we don't have a lot of details of what things are like in the spirit world. We do know that repentance is harder. It's been, That's been said before. But uh, we we really should not procrastinate. Let's just say that. And um, the only thing that we really know for sure when it comes to the millennium is if you're living a telestial lifestyle, you will not be moving on. But if you're at least terrestrial, you will. So that's another thing to take into consideration. The next one is from sunny California, 2023. Jared just returned from Utah. No one returned missionary or sealed person. I know personally under 35 were wearing their garments. They are all but gone. Maybe Sunday only. Not sure even then. Uh, all said it was too hot. All, so all of them said it was too hot. Some said the church changed it to go by the spirit on when to wear. Th- oh. No. <clears throat> go by the spirit on when to wear them. Not true, by the way. Uh, you're told in the in the temple to wear them throughout your life. I'm sad and completely confused by all this. Why is this happening, and why aren't the brethren saying anything specific to help back a back a to help back us old time wear your garments always people? Well, I think it's been said enough, and it, like you said, it's said in the temple, and we have a whole plethora of um, things that we can study. The <clears throat> the standards are out there. Uh, there are people that are actively going out in promoting this type of philosophy. Um, and, you know, you can't do anything about that. You can't stop them, and nor should you. You shouldn't stop somebody from talking. But uh, that's why we ourselves have to do the talking and the educating and help the brethren out. They can't do everything. That's one of the benefits of this channel and others is repeating quoting what they've already said share this video share this video with people that that need it um make a youtube channel yourself copy my quotes put them on your facebook uh timeline or wherever you want to put it take quotes instead of sharing the fluffy feel-good quotes that you always see with these different groups make real like valuable quotes like what I have here things that people don't like to talk about because it makes them feel uncomfortable or it reminds them that they're not doing what's right not to be an inquisitor but because we can't let the other side just keep pushing the fluffy feel-good narrative you have to step up and um, share the things that need to be heard and all the ammo that you need Uh, is right here. Well, not all the ammo. It depends on the topic, but there's a lot of ammo. This is a big cache of, uh, you know, spiritual weapons right here that you can use. Copy and paste this into your Facebook. Make your own memes. Say the hard things that need to be said. Don't be afraid of backlash because guess what? Satan is going to fight you on this through people that are under his influence. Oh, okay, so um, Paul Savage, 2157. I was an Eagle Scout court. Okay, I was at an Eagle Scout court of honor and not a single boy there. Even the Eagle Scout was in full uniform. I asked one of the leaders there who was a lieutenant colonel in the army how the army feels about such things. And his response was, quote, a partial uniform is no uniform. Yeah, I, I can attest to that. Uh, that said, they did change the temple recommend questions on this subject a little, leaving it more up to the individual to interpret how the temple instructions should be applied in their lives. Uh, like Sabbath day worship, how we deal with this is a sign of our faith. 
Okay, so we had recently gone over this talk. This is closing remarks of the October 2019 General Conference. He goes over the revised questions. This is President Nelson. In number 13, it says, Do you keep the covenants that you made in the temple, including wearing the temple garment as instructed in the endowment? So I don't, I don't think that that's right. Leaving it more up to the individual to interpret. No. I, I, sorry, I don't think that that's right. Uh, if you have a different, different information, no. It is expected that you should wear it at all times, except for things like swimming and stuff like that. Okay, Jocelyn Peace, 6656. Uh, there is some kind of mental gymnastics people have to go through to reach such a conclusion. If construction workers, athletes, military, etc. Can, can wear their uniforms in extremely hot weather, uh, under, understanding that it, is not only, it not only offers protection, but also identifies what they do and follow, how can you possibly justify not wearing them? Right. Well, and like I said, the, the burqa in the Middle East, one of the hottest places in the world. Uh, this is what you find. And someone had said, like, well, they don't go out during the day. Yes, they do. They go out during the day. When do you think this picture was taken? This is outside. It's during the day. You know, if they're able to do this, I'm pretty sure that we can uh, wear the garment which is basically substitutes what the, the world would typically wear as just regular underwear. That's just a tiny bit shorter. Okay. Uh, Susan Anderson, 276. I live in Arizona. Uh, it's been the hottest July on record. Yeah, we've talked about that on the channel, uh, how they broke that record for the number of days consecutive at or above 110 degrees. And they blew away the previous record. She says, my AC is on its way out. So my house has been 85 most days. I haven't taken off anything to stay cool. It's, it's a choice. I'm shocked at how I see some saints dressing these days, especially the youth. Agreed. Mike Newberry, 4064. I was listening to you talking about other Bednar's talk. I thought of how the king had a ring. So he's talking about his talk about the marriage feast, which is a symbol for the second coming. I thought of how the king had a ring with a special design um, with which he would seal a letter or document verifying that he approved of the contents of that letter. All those that entered the house, the Lord's house for the wedding were given a garment signifying that they uh, had been approved of by the Lord and had the right to be there. It was obvious that the man there without the garment was not approved of the Lord. It was an intruder. Is that, you guys, is that how you want to be seen at the second coming? You know, assu assuming that, well, for one, you definitely don't want to be living a telestial lifestyle because you, you were not going to be moving on past that point. But when it comes to Christ coming to his church, you know, um, being caught up, partaking in those very special events. Do you do you want to be seen as an intruder? Well, you won't be there in the first place. But if you somehow could force your way in, that's how you would be viewed as an intruder because you're not wearing the wedding garment. All right, continuing. Our honoring of temple covenants gives us the right to wear these special garments, indicating that we have the seal of the Lord Jesus Christ, allowing us the right to enter the presence of the Father. Yep. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> here's the last one. Tom, Tom Cat Jensen. I've never had a problem wearing my garments regularly, but I used to look for excuses to not wear them. I realized I was not wearing them for a simple hike or when going to the lake with my kids, even though I knew I wasn't going to swim. Or I'd put off showering after working out and end up without garments on for most of the day. Uh, it's kind of like me uh, going to do errands or whatever while you while I was out. I had a come to Jesus moment when I realized I was looking for excuses. I'm very careful and thoughtful now about when I remove them. It's a mindset change. Some friends uh, feel differently, but I have received my my own testimony of the covenants I I made. 
I have made when I hiked rim to rim last year with all LDS friends rim to rim. That must be some kind of famous hike or something somewhere. Uh, we had to tell, tell me more about that. If you want, if anyone knows what rim to rim is, what is that? Is that like a national park somewhere? Like not, not the name of the national park, but is there like a part of a national park where there's like a rim to rim hike uh does anyone know what this is talking about i'd be curious to know i I am curious to know when i hiked rim to rim last year with all lds friends we had to sleep the night before in the clothes we would hike in the next day and we had to change into those clothes around 4 p.m the day prior uh, since we were leaving our luggage at the north rim and catching a shuttle to the south rim to begin the hike on the hike we carried only a day pack None of my friends wore their garments that afternoon or that night to sleep. I knew I wasn't wearing them for the hike the next day, but I did not feel right about wearing them the afternoon and night before. So I wore them and packed them in my day pack for the hike. My friends didn't understand my decision. I didn't care. I felt right about my choice to carry a little extra bulk. I don't change them. I don't judge them for their choice. Uh, they haven't gained the same testimony that I have yet. All I can do is be an example. Well, yes, you can be an example. You can also tactfully and appropriately and in a non-antagonistic way talk about it and bring it up. And it might be uncomfortable, but as long as you're not pointing the finger or making it seem like you're casting judgment, it's appropriate to talk about things. It is. We have got to have... Um, we've got to have that backbone, right? Um, have a strong spiritual backbone, have a spine. Uh, by the way, in just a couple hours here, I'm going to the chiropractor. My, uh, physical backbone is not so good, but, um, and just really quick, let's see, rim to rim hike. Oh, is it the Grand Canyon? Because it looks like it's a bunch of uh, Grand Canyon things that are pulling up. It must be the the Grand Canyon. Let me know. Please put it in the comments below. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for your comments. Uh, the standards are clear. They're given to you in the temple as well, just flat out in General Conference and uh, other places. You can find them. The standards are clear. Heavenly Father is not going to overrule his own standards. We, we talked about that in the last video. If something's been revealed, he doesn't go back on that. There's not like little uh, exceptions or anything like that. Um, was there anything else I wanted to say? Oh, by the way, I forgot to uh, By the way, it was Greg Brown. He's the one that... Uh, Pointing me, pointing me to this uh, George Q. Cannon quote. Dang it. I need to go tab by tab by tab. Then I won't miss every, anything. All right. So thank you, Greg Brown. He's the one that pointed me to this. Originally, he pointed me to an Ensign article. But I, I always want to go directly to the actual source if I can. And so I did. And here it is. This is on the BYU Digital Collections part of their website. Okay, well, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.